Okay, we are now live. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today is May 31st, 2022. Uh, transit committee meeting from five to seven, a virtual meeting. Uh, go ahead and take roll call. And uh, we'll start off with Sandy Aldridge. I'm here. Brandon Oliver. Just saw him. Brandon Oliver. Yes, sir. There you are, Brandon. Thank you, you sir. Me? I yeah. got you now. That's a good thing. Uh, Georgia Burks. Georgia Burks. Jim Basson. John is here. Thank you, Jim. We are Dana Lux. Bill Denelux. Bill Loftus. Bill Loftus is here. Colin Kenton. Colin is here. Colin. All right. Thank you, Colin. I got that. My bad. We do have a forum on this day. Thank you all for being here on this day. And I'll go ahead and read the welcome announcement as we'll get into our agenda in a little bit. Welcome to the Asheville Transit Committee. We normally meet on the third Tuesday of the month uh, in City Hall, but we're meeting virtually. And we're meeting now from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. The Transit Committee is a volunteer citizens board designed to offer input and guidance to the Asheville Transit System and the City Council. We do not set or change routes, control Asheville's transit budget, or have authority over staff, drivers, or management company. We are a group of citizens like you who are here to ensure community concerns are taken into consideration when setting public transit policy. And in our call to order, we'll go ahead and uh, everybody has, uh, hopefully everybody has reviewed the minutes for today and the minutes for April 19th. So we'll go ahead and review for approval on both of those. Uh, may I get a motion to approve the minutes on Jan May 31st, 2022. I'll motion. Thanks, Sandy. I'll second that motion. Thank you. And we have a second. And it is approved. Okay, April 19th minutes, 2022 minutes. May I have a motion for those? Okay, hey, Harvey. So we just approved the agenda, or we just approved the minutes from the, the last minutes. meeting? We did the we did the minutes, and we have to approve the minutes for last month as well. Okay, so you have to should we approve the minutes preemptively. So before the meeting, we approve the minutes. That's the parliamentary procedure that we're going. Through. Okay. Okay. All right. Mr. So I'll, 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 I'll move to gets me every time you go. All right. I'll move to approve the minutes from April nineteenth. I have a second. Do I have a second? I'll second Harvey. The minutes are approved. Uh, we have no uh, public comment uh, on this meeting. So I'll forego the public comment uh, input for the meetings, the comment, the standards and opportunities. Uh, the new business uh, for today is the N3 and W6 service reductions. Uh, 
the N3 reduced schedule, W6 uh, reduced schedule. Can I get a member of staff, LaShawn, are you there? Or Barry? I can take it, unless Jessica wants to. You got it, Haley? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll share my screen. <clears throat> This is, again, there have been, if you're signed up for writer alerts, um, so getting emails or texts, you will have already been aware of this, but we just wanted to make sure you're all aware that there have been, um, there's reduced service or reduced frequency on the N3 and the W6 routes, um, similar to the W or the we one um, I guess reductions. This is related to not having enough drivers right now, and we're still actively working on retention. And I think Barry can give you an update on that later. Um, but just so you know, this has gone down from being um, every about well, every thirty minutes to now once every hour for the for the M three and the W six. Um, and again, these like considerations were based on how many drivers um, making these cuts could could save. Um, also, this being having some overlap with other routes um, and things like that. I don't know if Jessica, you want to add anything, or if any of you have any questions. No, obviously, this is not not something that we wanted to do and um and as you know we continue to have driver shortages that are impacting other routes as well and um having intermittent i guess is the best way to say it trip trip reductions uh based on the daily call outs is really what kind of leads to some of these last minute trip cut but um the the reduction that we put in place for the N3 and the W6 and the W1 were meant to try to pr have some more predictability and and cuts, but uh, you continue to see intermittent cuts throughout the week depending on drivers. So, you know, we're working very very hard to try to get additional drivers, and I think we're seeing an uptick in applications. So we're crossing our fingers that we can put some of these routes back in the service as soon as we can. Uh, Jessica, I sure. know we were yep. at a driver shortage. Uh, last figure that I got was somewhere around nine. Do we have more drive more than nine now? Short. Um, Jessica, maybe I could throw in on that one. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, currently, we would like to have a full board, a full complement of operators who would like to be at 63, and we're sitting at 51. So it's a little higher than the nine. Can we operate the service we're not operating right now if we have an additional seven, eight drivers? Yes. So that's the objective. We can get some more on board. And if we can pick away at it, we will. And there is kind of t talk in this presentation a little bit later about where we are with our numbers um, there. And as Jessica alluded to, there has been an uptick in applications and people in training, which is, is going to go help that number. Um, there was, our hope is that continues and that's what we're doing. We're going after whoever we can get to get on board for driving. Many of them do not have CDLs. So they are taking longer to get through the process and dealing with the Department of Motor Vehicle is also a, uh, a strain on, well, all reality. So um, we're doing everything that we can. We've actually hired a trucking firm to do our final certifications for the drivers. Um, kind of got out of the box there and they can work with us on that. So um, we have, I guess I can hit on it now if you'd like. We have five drivers in the pipe right now. One had uh, left us for a week. It appears she'll be back. We'll have her on the road by this weekend is what it looks like. So there's actually six people in training and uh, five of those need their CDL certifications. 
they are currently scheduled to get those certifications on the 10th of June. And then uh, they've been riding routes and driving routes and doing behind the wheel certification. So they'll be uh, ready to go when it comes time, once they do get their CDLs. And then we will put them out on routes doing revenue training, cadet, we call it cadet training with other drivers on the routes um, that they need to know and learn. Um, one thing that this has allowed us to do is make sure that the drivers <clears throat> ride all the routes and know the routes pretty well before they actually get behind the wheel at this point. But uh, timing is everything. And if we can get these six through in the next week, week and a half, uh, we'll look at what possibilities there are. Well, if they don't go till June 10th, so we're looking probably midweek to late the week after before they're ready to go on their own. Um, and when they are, we will look at seeing what kind of some of this service we can put back in at that point. That's our objective. Okay, thank you, Barry. Sure. John is in the queue. Go ahead, John. Oops, you're muted. John. You're muted, John. Sorry. So last month when we met, you said there were 51 and three in training. So now we have hired three more, essentially, which is good news, right? Correct. Um, all right. So, and then if they have their CDL, what is the, how long does it usually take to train if they, they have their CDL? You're, depending on whether they're a local or not, um, learning the system and understanding the routes, you know, they can be possibly done in four weeks. Um, okay. We're not getting a lot of local people. It's people that are moving into the area. So it, it'll take an additional week to get them familiar with all the routes that they'd be running. So there's like light at the end of the tunnel potentially that we may be able to get some of these routes back to full capacity, like by that's, fall. That's, if, if that's these, correct. If yeah. we continue this trend, that's good. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, it is. Yep. Okay, Colin is in the queue. Yes, I'm wondering, I guess I got two questions. The first question is, with regards to the um, reduction in service, uh, was there a methodology in determining the reduction and which which routes to reduce and how to reduce, et cetera? Jessica's muted. You're muted, Jessica. I'll let Jessica um, have uh, the answer. Sure. So, um, of course, there's a methodology. Primarily, what we looked at first was frequency. So we didn't want to cut a route completely that wouldn't, so we wouldn't serve an area at all. So if a route had multiple frequency per hour, then cutting it um, in half or, you know, reducing the frequency, we deem to be a slightly less impactful choice. Um, so the routes that we've cut right now had multiple frequency per hour. Um, and then we also looked at the number of drivers that are necessary for those routes. Um, most, almost all of our routes are interlined. Um, so it's, there's, you know, an in, if you're cutting, the, so the W6 and the M3 are interlined. One driver drives both of those routes and kind of in a continuous loop. Um, and so, we look at you know the inner lining as well, um, and and just trying to focus on routes that um, hopefully will have the least impact overall. But recognizing that any cuts in service have a huge impact on people. Um, okay, and just real quick, I wanted to follow up on one one of uh, John's questions. Um, so, you know, we have not just driver shortages, but shortages with supervisors and dispatchers. And so typically um, our goal is to move drivers up into dispatch or supervisor role. So most recently uh, we did promote some existing drivers into a supervisor or dispatcher role which then created an additional um, 
uh, backfilling necessary for drivers. So, so 51, we still have 51, um, but that also accounts for a couple people moving into a higher, higher role. And I had one more quick question. Go ahead, Colin. And I guess it had to do with um, driver um, employee retainage and assuming that y'all are taking steps to, to retain the employees since, uh, since you don't want to get yeah. them around, get their CDL and lose them two weeks later. So. Yeah, and, and there's, there's a, <clears throat> there's a potential that people will get their CDL and leave. There always is, there always has been. There's really no way to hold their feet to that fire. Um, you know, there's always talk of, oh, well, we can make them sign a document says we trained you and it costs this much and all that good stuff. But quite honestly, none of that works by the time you start going down the legal path. So the objective is to, you know, to continue to make this a place people want to be. We haven't had massive turnover recently. It is just, it is, you know, trickled down. We've had a couple of retirements. We've had, um, we've had a couple of people that just, just don't want to do this anymore. And then our competition is truck driving out there and truck driving in this region <clears throat> is fighting for every driver they can get. And they have done a ton of things with wages, which, which we can, we can, we could go, we've gone up. We went from $15 an hour, eight months ago to train to 1878. So we've, We've done well and we went from 1806 or 1804 to 1878 on the wage package as well. So yeah, we're doing what we can for retention. Um, and and we and we keep going at it. We don't, we don't, I know right now, uh, I am aware of one driver who is thinking of retiring. Um, and that's the only one I know of right now that's looking at moving away from us at this point. So yeah, we're, we're watching that closely as well because retention is extremely important, always has been. And uh, you know, the, the drivers we have do a good job and we wanna keep them out there. Um, and wanna keep them with us. So that's how we approach it. Make it a decent place to work and a decent place to be. So part of the problem is, uh, you know, the, the shifts that they do, they do late evenings, they do weekends. We run as much service on a Saturday as we do on a weekday. So, you know, that's that's six days and, and Sunday only because we start a little later and cut off a little earlier. Otherwise, there's 19 buses out there all day, just like a Saturday, just like Monday through Friday. So it's uh, it's a challenge to get everything covered. And as Jessica said, we've had, uh, you know, depending on call offs and quite honestly, this last weekend was was a bear. And and, and when you th when you think back over the last year, all of these people have busted their fannies trying to be sure that we're putting the service out there. I am so proud of the whole group of people that they're they're working hard to keep what we do have out there going. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Are there any more questions? Uh, Haley, you want to handle the FY 20, 22, 23? I think Jessica will take it. Oh. Yep, I'm going to take it, Harvey, and I am oh, going to you. share my screen in a moment. Uh, let's see. Okay, let me put this in fancy mode. All right, so. Um, what I wanted to talk about with you guys today is um, a little bit about our operating budget. Um, and just to note, operating is uh, different from capital. So I'm not gonna talk about our budget when it comes to buying buses or putting in bus shelters or fixing, um, fixing our transit center or any of that. This is just about operation. So the driving, mostly the driving of the bus, buses and the maintenance of the system. 
And um, I'll talk a little bit about the past several years and the year, the current fiscal year that we're in right now, FY22, which is about to end here um, on June 30th. And then I will talk about um, our next fiscal year budget, which um, we are in the process of finalizing as part of the overall city budget in the next couple, next few weeks. Um, so there are several revenue sources that the city has for paying for transit operations. The largest source of funding for transit is coming from our city's general fund. And our general fund is essentially uh, made up of property taxes and sales taxes and some other, other sources that the city gets. And the general fund pays for basically every everything that doesn't have some kind of revenue source on its own. Um, and so it, in our table here, you can see the last several years, and you can see that back in 2016, the general fund was only providing $1.7 million. Fast forward to this year that we're currently in, you can see where general funds up to almost $7 million. So there's been a significant increase in the, in the money that's coming from the city's general fund. And um, those increases are primarily for a couple reasons. Our transit system has grown substantially in the last several years, but also the city's general fund has had to pitch in more because some of our other revenue sources, such as federal revenue, have been decreasing. Um, and then, you know, we also see just normal kind of regular increases in costs, um, especially over the last couple of years. Uh, and just, just so you guys know, any, if you have any questions while we're doing this, we can, you're welcome to interrupt me. Um, so, this is a table that shows a couple of our our next biggest, I guess, revenue sources, which is um, federal transit administration revenue. So that's federal money that we get every year. And then we also get some money from the state, uh, state of North Carolina as well. And so, um, I, you know, looking at FY22, um, we got about 2.6 million between both the feds and the state. And if you look at the totals as you go from 2016 to 22, they kind of bounce around a little bit. Uh, we get more state revenue now than we used to. We get less federal revenue than we used to. And part of that is because um, one of the sources of revenue are urban urbanized grants, section 5307, those get distributed actually by the local or the regional planning agency. And uh, so they're the ones that determine how some of those funds get divvied up. And several years ago, the formula that they used to divvy those funds up amongst the region was altered and resulted in Asheville, Asheville's transit system getting less money and other regional transit systems like uh, Buncombe County, Henderson County, Hendersonville getting more. Um, so we've had to kind of make up for some of that as well. Um, you see in 2021, we got zero revenue from the state. That was COVID and the state budget was bad. And so they cut that, that funding from us that year, which was um, a significant loss for us. We had to use CARES Act revenue to plug that gap. Um, and we've had to use CARES Act and ARPA mon money to plug plug other gaps, which I'll talk about in a, in a little bit as well. Um, we also have some other, what I call miscellaneous revenue that's not super substantial, but somewhat helpful. We do get some motor vehicle registration 
um, funding. That's about 360 a year. We do we do sell advertising on the buses. That's pretty minimal in terms of revenue. And uh, we sell buses once they've reached their end of their useful life, but that brings in barely anything. And then transit fares, um, this is gives us about 13 to 15 percent of our of our revenue um, and that's not abnormal very normal for transit systems to not pay for themselves in terms of fares if they if we charged a fare that covered the entire cost of transit nobody would be able to afford to ride it so um, it's heavily subsidized as you can see by by other sources of revenue uh, the red line and well, the yellow line and the red line account for uh, COVID. So you can see in 2021, our, our fare revenue was very low. Um, and these are fiscal years, by the way. And um, so, you know, because we, we went zero fare for a significant portion of COVID. And um, you can see that our 2022, so our current fiscal year, fares are trending back up again. However, we expect to be substantially lower than we were in pre-COVID uh, years. So moving on to the expense side of the equation, um, I didn't total these up, but I just wanted to show you, these are the big expenses, um, RATP dev, our contract with them annually, and that covers the maintenance, the operations, essentially every driver, every mechanic, every customer service rep, um, every uh, part and uh, tire and all the things that go onto a bus um, as part of maintenance and preventative maintenance. Those are all put into one giant contract and um, you can see between 2019 when RITP Dev came on board with the city and now that contract cost has increased. Um, some of that is again, just natural increases in cost, but most of it is because we've expanded service each of those years. Um, paratransit is a contract that we, the city does with the county and uh, we are federally obligated to provide paratransit service. And uh, you can see that those costs have risen over the years. This past year, and um, this past year, it, it's gotten gone on, down a little bit. And next year, we expect it to be lower than it than its peak, um, mostly because of COVID. And you know, we expect that those those. Um, costs will eventually go back to what what they were pre-COVID. Um, building and equipment maintenance and repair, that's another one of our larger line items. And um, that's really meant to try to, to keep our facilities running, primarily the transit center and the transit garage, um, but also some of the equipment within those, those buildings. Fuel is always a big expense. The red, the red number, seven hundred thousand. That's what we're estimating for fuel this this year. Um, so that was uh, is way is coming in way higher than what we originally budgeted for. As you know, you know fuel costs have been going up a lot, and um, that's had a big impact on our budget for this current fiscal year. <clears throat> um, the next line item is city staff. And so that's like our transit planning manager, that's Haley, that's Amy, um, that's a grant manager. So basically four people um, and, you know, training and uh, what else? All of the, all of the things that it costs to, to have these transit staff with the city who are working with RATPD or a TP DAV on a daily basis. Contracted services is is referring to primarily, I would say, our technology-based 
um, items, if you will. So the software and systems that we have on our buses that track the buses for so the GPS systems and the software to, to do that, our, our scheduling software, um, the software that's used to run the head signs on the buses that tell you what bus number it is. We've probably got between, I don't know, seven and 10 different technology based contracted services that are ongoing annually. Um, to, to run the service. So this current budget year, as I said, it ends on June 30th. Um, fuel costs have been a big increase in this last three months. Um, the other thing that has been a significant issue for us, and, and I, I guess I skipped this slide, but um, parking, our parking fund, which is another enterprise fund, which means that it's separate from our general fund. Parking has been contributing revenue to the transit fund for several years. And over the last maybe three to four years, that's been about $1.6 million coming from parking. But parking has been um, essentially operating in the red the last two years primarily due to COVID and um, our the parking fund is about well it's it's definitely a couple million dollars short so by law if uh, if a parking fund can't support its own operation that can't give money over to another purpose this year unfortunately um, parking is not going to be able to make that contribution which results in a, a big hole in our revenue for transit. Um, so all in all, what we're looking at for the close of this fiscal year is a $1 million shortfall. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, you know, we had received um, about $1.8 million from the American Rescue Plan Act. And last year we had had and budgeted $1 million of that to be used to go towards the expansion that we wanted to and planned to do this past October, but couldn't do because we didn't have enough drivers. Um, unfortunately, what that means is that that $1 million that we sort of earmarked for that expansion is now going to have to help fill our budget shortfall this year. So I'm thankful we have ARPA to help backfill that hole, um, that we got that those stimulus funds to help us offset that hole. But um, what we're looking at is, you know, even if we had the drivers in hand to do that expansion of service, um, we wouldn't necessarily have the funding for it. Um, so, you know, some, as we talked about staffing shortages, not just drivers, it's all of our staff. Um, and that's our, you know, city planning staff as well too. So we're supposed to have four FTEs in the city for transit. We've got two right now. Um, we're working on filling those holes, but it's, it's just as difficult to hire people on the city side as it is to hire really in any organization right now. Um, Asheville is now the highest cost of living in the state. So that doesn't really help. Um, our wages can't really go up as quickly as the cost of living goes up. And so that's a, that's a challenge. CBL drivage shortage, that's been going on for years, even before COVID. And we can't really match the market rate for CDL drivers right now. Um, and so, you know, the end result is that we have turnover, uh, we have recruiting challenges, and then when you don't have the number of people, you can't run the service. And so that's what's resulting in the cuts that we're all experiencing right now, unfortunately. So, um, so yeah, so the $1 million that we had originally earmarked 
to help our service expansion that we didn't implement last October. Unfortunately, we have to use that to fill our budget gap for this year. So, so for next year, which starts July 1st, um, we're, we're basically saying that we cannot expand our system until we get not only more drivers but and more staff, but additional revenue. Um, the city's general fund really can't uh, really can't afford or doesn't have the capacity to continue to increase its contribution substantially. Um, we have our just our normal expenses for the existing service going up by over half a million dollars this coming year. Some of that we're, we're attributing to um, the increased fuel costs that we think will will continue for a little while. Um, what I will say though is that the city manager in the budget um, is looking to increase wages for city staff, but also for transit staff um, because you know, we know that we need to do something more, whether or not it will be enough, we don't, none of us know, but there's an additional 500 grand or so, which equates to about $2 per hour per person that we'll be adding to the transit contract with RETP Dev. Um, and we hope that that helps recruit and we hope that that helps retain staff. Um, we still think that that's um, maybe a little short of what the market rate would be for a CDL driver, um, but that's unfortunately all that we can afford at this moment. Um, so we are budgeting in some parking revenue to be contributed this year, this coming year. So instead of 1.6 million, we're um, looking at transferring 1 million from parking Hopefully that can be done, um, assuming that our parking revenues bounce back a lot more than they have. And um, essentially what this all means is that our expenses are going up, um, our revenue is still going down. And so we have to use some uh, American Rescue Plan money, the remaining American Rescue Plan money that the transit got and we're also having to use some of the city's American Rescue Plan money uh, that the city got to help ba help balance the budget for next year. Um, it's not really, you know, um, anybody's preference to use one-time stimulus money for for ongoing costs, but um, it's ne it's a necessity if we don't want to cut our transit service substantially um, and we want to try to keep our transit drivers and other transit workers here. Um, so it's a stopgap measure. Hopefully it works. Hopefully everything gets better and back to normal soon. Um, but we're definitely in an extremely challenging time as I think everybody knows. So, um, that's the that's the short that's the quick and dirty of it. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. I know it's a um, complicated topic. Yeah, Jessica, uh, I had one. Take my hand off there. Um, since we are down on revenue and all this, um, are we still in the mark for looking for a, a place, a, a, another transit, you know, another maintenance facility? Um, yes and <clears throat> yes and no. Um, we do need another facility. I would say that that is besides money. There, I mean, really, money is the only barrier here. Um, a new maintenance facility, we need it in order to expand our service. Right now, the the garage is fifty years old. Uh, we can't fit any more buses there, can't fit any more staff there. 
maintenance. We don't have enough maintenance bays. So if the city wants to expand service someday, we need a new facility. Now, how do we pay for that? Um, a facility could be anywhere between 50 million and $75 million. Um, you know, the first step is to find a piece of land, um, which is challenging enough to, to try to find a piece of land that is uh, meets the size that we need, which would be about a minimum of seven acres. Um, land is at a premium. So, you know, I guess the answer is no. <laughs> we don't have anything on the immediate horizon, but um, we, you know, we'll still look for every opportunity we can. I think, grant, I mean, a grant, a major grant from the feds is pretty much the only way that we're going to be able to get uh, get a major project like that done. So um, that's a big barrier for us. So facilities. if the next, next five buses we come in, where are we going to park them? We're going to park them at your house, Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah really like um, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, it's a challenge. We're trying to make space anywhere we can. Um, you know, some of the buses that we buy are replacing existing old buses. So our fleet, total fleet size is not getting a lot bigger. Um, but we, you know, we may have to start parking some buses at the uh, parking lot next door to the transit center. Uh, we now own that piece of property, so that's an opportunity. But, um, yeah, if, if if we had a whole 10 more buses delivered to us tomorrow, we wouldn't have a place to park them. So, okay. yeah. Uh, Colin's in the queue. Sure. So, Jessica, in, in looking at your the proposed budget for next year and you're showing the what a three hundred thousand dollar use of the ARPA fund to cover the central shortfall for next year and some of that being I guess lack of parking revenue related. Do y'all see that projecting that going forward in fiscal 24-25 is do y'all see that as just a, a short term blip where and the ARPA can can backfill that just temporarily, and then, then yeah, you know, in the following year we'll be back to normal again. Um, I I my gut tells me that we probably will be much closer to normal in the parking fund by FY twenty four. I will say though that you know parking. Parking has its own major needs in terms of our garages um, and their their needs. We've got four city parking garages. Uh, one of them is 50 years old. Two of them are 35 years old. And so those things have to be maintained as well, you know. So, you know, overall, I, I would like to see, if I had my parking hat on, I'd like to see parking um, reduce its contribution to transit so that it could squirrel away some more money for long-term maintenance of garages. But um, anyways, I do think that our our financial ability to make the policy decision to make that transfer from parking to transit will be um, better by that time. Okay, Sandy is in the queue. You're muted, Sandy. Yeah, I was yeah. trying to make the hand go there away this go. time. Successful with that. Um, so uh, switching up a little bit, but still on the uh, same subject as far as budgeting. Um, in the past, um, I believe there was a contract with APD to provide safety for the ARC station. Um, what, is there anything in the future um, pertaining to that, that we can look at um, as far as I think it's very dangerous at the art station um, and the security guards have no um, way of securing um, at certain times. 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there, so RETP Dev did previously have a contract with um, the APD. They had a con well, they had a contract with the private security, and then APD would um, come in in the evening hours, and those officers would um, get paid under contract with RETP Dev as the APD staffing numbers got worse and worse, they were unable to fulfill that role. And so RATP Dev shifted the funds that were used to pay the APD officers to increase the number of security guards, the private security guards. However, even that's been a challenge to staff because those private security companies can't find workers either. Um, and they're also unarmed, so they have slightly less ability, I think, to, um, well, I, I guess they don't maybe have as much of a presence, if you will. So, you know, I think that something as APD's budget and staffing numbers get better, it could be something that we explore again is, is trying to employ their services again. But we recognize that it's, it's been challenging. Um, are there any other options at all? Um, well, there. one thing that we have been exploring, and we actually submitted a grant application to the city um, to use ARPA money for, but it wasn't awarded, unfortunately. Uh, we worked with Better Buses Together and um, Anchor, which is a nonprofit, to, we came up with a proposal to have um, community, um, I forget what, what the, the term was, but essentially like community resource people that could be there, not necessarily for security, but to help people um, have access to services and needs. Mm -hmm. um, and so unfortunately that wasn't funded we still want to explore that and see if we can put that program in place somehow. Um, but that's the only option that we've explored so far outside of contracted security or APD. Okay, I'll, I'll look into it and she froze. I think she froze, yeah. yeah. Bill? Yeah. You're in the queue. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so the history of the revenue sources from 16 to 22, it impressively went up a lot from 16 to 22, basically almost four times. So that was interesting. Do the expenses generally match the revenue because it looks like it does this year there's roughly 10 million or so in revenue sources across or i didn't add them all up but that looks like about what your expenses were so where this is going is if is that a correct assumption first that the expenses generally are close to the funding sources is that generally the way it works uh, yeah, well, yes, they have to be. We have to have yes. a balanced budget. So, yeah. um, but the the driving cost of transit is the personnel and yeah. the drivers. And yeah. yeah, so, yeah, so anytime we um, increase service or even just keep the same service we have, but things get more expensive, yeah. the city has to have the revenue to to pay for that right okay, um, so, so yeah so the, the help me as i go through the question so the, the we've increased funding by 3.8 times in the last seven years now some of that's eaten away with inflation and i don't know how much that would be but what's the difference in our service now versus 2016 are, are we roughly three times as many routes as we were in 2016? 
Uh, I would say yes. Um, I can't. I, I can't off the top of my head go back and and recall yeah. what the number of service hours were back then, but I can tell you that between 2019 and 2020, so January 5th of 2020, we implemented a 25% service increase. That was probably okay. the biggest um, year over year increase in service. Okay. Um, so that's one of the big jumps that you see. Um, and and uh, the others are probably for inflationary costs, but also um, um, what's the, what am I looking for? Uh, other kind of incremental service increases, revenue hour increases. Okay. Well, because it sounds like, I mean, if everything's linear, we must have a whole lot more service now than we did seven years ago. And and that that should be impressive um, because when we in these calls, we're talking about dropping, you know, a portion of one route, which is a portion of one nineteenth of the system, right? So mm -hmm. we're talking about taking away like five percent per route or something or rough numbers but just in the grand scheme of things we're three or so times more we have that much more capacity now than we did seven years ago if, if these numbers are linear and they add up that way am, am i looking at that right i think generally yeah i think you're i think you are and you know one thing that we could add to this presentation that would help is um, a comparison of the revenue hour. So um, like for example, right now we're running, I think 101,000 service hours a year. Um, and we could show, you know, what, how many revenue hours were we running each year previous? That's really the, the number that changes or is easy, the easiest to understand in terms of the service that's being provided is how many revenue service hours is the system running. Um, so we could go back and add that information that would help you help understand the scale of the service year after year. I mean, the reaction is if we cut a portion of a route right now, we're still far better than we were seven years ago was my reaction to these numbers. Is that, does that feel accurate or did we, the other thing that's related did we expand our hours per day coverage or something or did we expand we, frequency? We, added, did we... we added sunday service there was none in that okay. time frame we added later mm -hmm. night service and then duplication of uh, additional service to different routes which increased the frequency and i think okay. jessica's right the easiest way to see that would be revenue hours to see okay. where they came up to show what those percentages went up to because of it. Okay. And then my second question on what you were saying, I know you didn't intend to show it, but I would love just a one minute brief description of what is the capital process like? How do you get money for new buses? Um, that is equally as challenging. Um, Although I would say it's easier to get capital money than it is to get operational money in general, because there's where does, it, um, where does it come from? It's kind of a mixture as well. So, so for example, we apply every year. In fact, Haley will attest to this. She and I have been frantically working over the last week or so to put together an application. Uh, for buses, new buses. Um, we apply every year for discretionary grants. Uh, discretionary is just another word for apply competitively and pray that you get an award, but you probably won't get awarded because you're competing against a whole bunch of other agencies. Um, so grants, grants is a, is a place. And in those cases, when you do get lucky enough to get an award, uh, the feds will pay 80% of the cost and the city is responsible for 20% of the cost. And 
Um, we've been fortunate to receive some grants over the past several years that have allowed us to purchase buses, but um, we just I think this year spent the last of our remaining grant funds and so we're trying desperately to find more funds for buses. Um, yeah, That's so capital improvement program, the city's capital improvement program is what will help fund that 20% or if we need to buy buses and we don't have grant funds, then the capital improvement program can help, but it, it too is very constrained. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, Colin has raised his hand. He's in the queue. Yes, thank you. So, so Bill's questions about, you know, operating and expenses and revenue raise another question for me. So in, I guess, in fiscal year 2019, y'all, the city went under contract yeah. for bus service with RAP Dev. Before that, was it all city staff operated? No, um, it it was also operated under a contract with a different provider, but the contract was vastly different. It was just for the um, essentially just for the management and the operational staff but all of the expenses related to maintaining the buses were not in the contract. They were uh, just direct funded by the city. So it's, it's difficult to do like a apples to apples comparison of the contract costs because they were so differently set up. Um, so the contract type that we have now, we call it a turnkey. Um, and so it's essentially the whole kit and caboodle goes into that contract and um, they, they under that contract, they do all the maintenance, they pay for all the parts. Uh, we give them a bus, the city owns a bus and we give them the buses to run, but then pretty much every cost after that is on the contract through the contract that makes sense. Okay. And then uh, on the routes, um, and, and you know, there's plenty of rumors out there. So I had heard that at one time, UNC Asheville provided some funding for the buses that for N1 and N2 that go up around UNC mm. Asheville. And then that some point in time they decided they didn't want to help anymore because they have their own little service but in one and into still do that is that is there any truth to that rumor and i guess do we does the city get any funding from the bus services that they provide outside of city limits for like black mountain and other places so. mm -hmm. um so for your first question about UNCA, um, they provide a very small amount of funding to us to run the N1, N2 um, late night service on weekends. And that was paused during COVID. Um, and we stopped running that service because they were not able to pay for it um, during COVID. I don't know if like way back in the past, there was a financial or different financial arrangement. I don't think there was. Um, I would say that UNCA contributes very little and it's really just for that late night service on weekends. And it's only during um, when school's in session too. So when it's not in session, we don't run it and they don't pay for it, um, but they have resumed paying for it now that we're out of out of COVID, sort of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then uh, your other question uh, about paying for service outside of the city limits, that is kind of a mixed bag. Um, 
Yes. I think generally speaking, the answer to that is yes. Um, the county pays for service on the W6, um, no, W5, I think, that extends outside of city limits and goes up to the angles on New Leicester Highway. They do pay a portion. Um, they, they provide some support for that. They um, also, this coming year, have uh, agreed to help support the 170 and Black Mountain has as well. So, you know, we're, we're attempting to recoup some costs for service that's provided outside of the city. Um, it's somewhat piecemeal. For example, like the S3 and the S6, we don't, we haven't requested any funding support um, from the county, but if you look at the route, it kind of goes in the, in the city, out, in, out, because the way the boundaries of the city limits kind of goes in and out on that route. So um, that's kind of where we're at right now with outside funding support. Thanks. Okay. If there are no more questions, we'll move right along. Uh, excuse me. We're at the FTA section 5339 and 5339C grant applications. Sure. Um, I'll go ahead and take it, Haley, if you want. And if, uh, if you want to chime in on anything, let me know. But um, I, as I was saying in this last agenda item, um, we we attempt to get grant funding whenever wherever we can every year the federal transit administration has a competitive grant opportunity for um well they have two opportunities one is called the low or no emissions grant program and the other one is called the buses and bus facilities grant program uh, this year they released both of those grant opportunities at the same time and thankfully allowed um, applicants to essentially use one application to apply for both grants. So what we did was we submitted an application for um, six hybrid buses. Uh, five of those would be replacement buses for five existing hybrids that we have that are going to be at the end of their useful life in 2023. Um, and then the sixth bus, we wouldn't be considered a replacement bus, um, but would help us um, just in general with our fleet and our maintenance of our fleet and trying to keep it in a state of good repair, as the feds like to call it. Um, and we also, in our application, asked for funding to um, allow us to buy three replacement batteries for um, our hybrid buses that are are not quite at their useful life, end of their useful life, but will be um, in the next few years. So um, the total that we asked for was about $5 million the city's match would be 20% of that. So it worked out to be about $750,000. The council approved our, us applying for the grant at their meeting on the 24th. And, um, you know, before anybody asks, I'll say, you know, the reason that we're applying for hybrid buses and not electric buses um, for you, for those of you that are newer is because nobody in the industry yet is making a 30 foot electric bus and that's really the size that is kind of the, the maximum size that we can comfortably drive on all of our routes um, without having problems the five electric buses that we have are unfortunately a little bit too big for many of our routes so it's limited our use um, the other issue that we're have had with electrics here is that we can only get um, a portion of the day's use out of them. 
um, due to limitations and charging ability. So, you know, our primary goal with our very limited funding sources is to get buses that that can be used all day long and can be used on any route. Um, and so, um, hybrids are, are 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 our ideal vehicle because they do have some um, climate benefit, but they still get the job done. Um, they are more expensive than a diesel vehicle, but if we can get grant funding to support the purchase of them, then that's obviously the, the preference for us. Um, and the grant was due or is due today at 11.59 p.m., but we submitted it at 5.30. So cross your fingers that we will get a grant award to allow us to buy six buses and three battery packs. <laughs> And and round of applause to Haley because she did the she did ninety nine percent of the work on it. So thank you, Haley. Thank you, Haley. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it's not easy. They don't make it easy. It's not like you write one page. We want six buses. Thank you. It's way more involved than that, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Haley, did you have anything to add to that? I was just going to say, that's why I look so stressed today. I'm like looking in the video in my oh, veins. <laughs> but we're done and it's good. I'm glad you're good. Yeah. Funding. You. Okay, moving right along. Um, staffing for our ATPD, Dale Barry, would you like to enlighten us? Sure. I, I pretty well hit on most of what we've got going on earlier. Um, and, you know, we've hired a full-time recruiter. Uh, we, we, we still have a hire bonus. We still have a referral bonus for our current employees. Um, I, I was asked to speak at the city council meeting earlier this month. And, you know, basically is this the, let's, let's put it this way. Is this the magic bus? No, I don't know that it is. I don't know that any of us have all of the the right answers um, but the industry has really been suffering the last 18 months uh, countrywide and uh, I think we're fortunate to be where we are and and very fortunate to have right now 12 people in a pipe um, you know two three months ago we didn't have anybody in the pipe we weren't able to get anybody attracted to do this work so we're encouraged by that. We're excited by that and uh, hoping to continue that trend. Okay, thank you, Barry. Yep. Oh, business. Bus stop improvement project, general update. Haley. <laughs> Yeah, there's not too much new to report on this um, for anyone who's new, which, by the way, welcome, Colin. Um, so the city was awarded a million dollar grant to make bus stop improvements um, across our system. So looking at things like new shelters, new seating and lighting, um, new signage opportunities. Um, and most we've done a few things since we first got that grant. So we've done some demolitions of old shelters that weren't in a good um, state so that we can replace them with new shelters. We've replaced, I think, five of those with new shelters. Um, some shelters were able to just take out the old plexiglass, which we know a lot of that looks pretty rough around the city, but we've been able to replace some of that um, and retrofit those. Um, with new glass. Um, but yeah, most recently we were working on RFP for some different lighting solutions where it's basically a pole next to the stop um, the, or the shelter. And sometimes it would be standalone lighting and other, in other cases, we're going to have these small little seats for people to sit at as well, rather than um, a full bench where some, in some places, in some stops, there's not room for that. 
but we finished the RFP, but we have to wait until um, the next budget, um, next fiscal year, so basically in July, to actually put that RFP out. And in the meantime, we're going to start working um, on some other RFPs for things like um, new benches and things like that. So no big update, but we are moving forward with that. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions or comments on that? I don't see anybody in the queue. Thank you, Hayden. Thanks. Uh, for, for the, uh, update on art for the fiscal year 22 transit bus acquisition i think jessica has covered that quite well unless she wants to say something else about it um well i'll just i'll just note that so you know we submitted a grant but we also had placed some orders for buses over the last couple of years um that we'll be receiving this year we will be getting um our four new vicinity buses um, that will be I think by the end of July um, and we'll be getting giving them back those ugly loaner buses that have been on a part of our fleet for the last couple of years when we get those new buses from them um, and then we also have three Gillig uh, diesel buses that are uh, going to be delivered, I think, this fall, um, I think by September, if I remember correctly. So, you know, we try to place orders every year to keep up with those that we have to retire. Um, and that's a challenge when we don't have the funds for it. But um, we've got some new buses coming in and hopefully we get this grant to get us some more next year. Okay, thank you. Sounds good. Are there any questions? I think Sandy's got a question. Yeah, I was just wondering real quickly, where are, yes, Harvey, um, where are the buses being delivered from? Um, well, most of our buses are Gillig buses. Gillig's the company and they're based out of California. So when we order a bus from Gillig, they build it in California and then they deliver it to us here. Um, the vicinity buses, those are actually, that's actually a Canadian company. And so they'll be delivering us those from Canada. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it, is it in Vancouver? I think so. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank so. you so much. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. Okay, moving right along to transit member updates and rider experiences. Do we have any? Um, I have a couple of things uh, whenever I'm allowed to speak if anybody else has something real quick. Go ahead, Sandy. Um, I have to mention something again, um, which is some driver conduct. Um, there have been situations where I do have videos um, and also three female employees of a very uh, big business, I'll say in Asheville, um, asked me to watch out for one of their uh, co-employees because she is getting harassed some way somehow on a city bus. So I'm going to look into that and find out exactly who's doing it. Um, Cause a lot of people know me and, uh, and I'm not scared to ask someone why they're harassing a female, um, whether it be a rider or a bus driver. Um, Cause a lot of uh, riders have been complaining about being yelled at as I also have myself. So we're continuing to try to improve on some driver conduct because some drivers believe that, you know, they're not gonna lose their jobs any way, shape or form, and they can have whatever conduct that they desire. Okay. 
Thank you, Sandy. Barry, did you want to address that? Uh, only to say that uh, the video and the audio on the buses works very well. So if we have incidents, um, it's critical to get the report to us as soon as possible, which allows us to review and check. Um, I would say 98% of the time, you know, we have the ability to see and hear exactly what is occurring. And then we do deal with it and we do deal with driver misconduct directly. And uh, we don't want to see it out there. We, everybody knows we do deal if deal with something that comes up on a complaint and then we pull video and audio and have the ability to check and see exactly what happened. So for all of you and some of the new members, if, if, if you hear of something, please let us know. We want to dig into it. We want to figure out what's going on and, uh, you know, time and date, location, bus number, even, um, those things help us to nail down a video and, uh, and figure out what we got going. Um, can I add something real quick? Sorry. Um, I would just suggest to everyone to take a video if something's going on. Um, if a driver is uh, not acting like uh, protocol or policy uh, directs them to, because it is better just in case they can't find the video of the situation, it is always best to have uh, your own copy, a copy for someone that you're trying to help out. Um, and this is. Uh, this has progressed for me over years, okay? So, um, and that's what I always suggest to everyone. And I, I'll, I'll try to write complaints down myself because um, a lot of people, they don't know how to uh, navigate at all. And I didn't at all in the beginning, but now I do. And the buses are for the people. So I appreciate you all. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, Bill Loftus is in the queue as well. Bill, are you there? Yeah. No caller. Hold on to that. Um, no. <laughs> Can't turn it off. There. Um, is Harvey, is this the time we, we just have questions, the committee update, or should I reserve a question for later? If you have an update, Bill, yes, uh, it will be fine. And also, if you have a rider experience, we'd love to hear that too. No, it's not a rider, and it's not an update. But I got a question for the for the group. But I don't know if there's another point in the meeting where we do that. Uh, we're getting close to the end. I think you should say it now. Okay, so we were just talking about buying buses and what our bus spec is we've got we've had a conversation in the group around long buses versus short buses or different types of buses electric versus otherwise um what i would like to bring up is i would like for this group to be part of the analysis of those things so that we all understand what goes into that so that's my request and I'd like to hear from staff if that's possible. Do you mean that like specifically that when we're applying for grants or just in general? No, like what should our bus look like? Okay, like in terms of length and things? Length, fuel, all that kind of stuff that we've we've had conversations about, but we've never actually arrived at conclusions other than the fact that we've been told that we have the buses we desire because they're the best but we don't really understand why and so from a citizen's perspective which i think is our role correct me if i'm wrong but i'd just like to understand what goes into the thought process of of our designs that's all and so it's also it's a it's obviously a long lead time item. We ordered buses last year for something that's going to show up this fall. Mm -hmm. So it's a long lead time. So we certainly have time to go through it. I know you guys don't have much time, but I don't 
I just feel a need to understand more about what goes into the process. Barry, Jessica, would you answer that, please? Um, sure. And eventually, I guess we can put something uh, more to special, more specific together. But we have a small fleet. We have a small system. We have 32 buses right now. When you have a small fleet, the the primary things you're looking for for a vehicle are life cycle cost. Um, and hey Jessica, can I? I just I don't want to belabor the time on the explanation yeah. right now. I want to ask if we can be party to what goes into the process. I think we can report to you what goes into the process, but I don't know that. Um, you know, we're going to talk about like, uh, well, I mean, okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, we can do that. There, there's variable and it's, it always comes down to a cost and efficiency and, um, uh, how many people can we move? Right. So. I can, we can put something together that kind of walks through the different variables of, of why we have what we have and why we choose what we choose. Um, and there's always opportunity to talk about other types, but I think that what you'll find is that what we have does make sense um, for the system that we have and our cost constraints that we have. Um, but we can put something together. I can't promise it'll be for the next meeting, though, but we can do that um, as quickly as possible. Well, and Thanks, I, don't want, I, I mean, I'm not requesting you go belabor a lot of stuff. Um, I, 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 we need to be efficient for your sake, too. So. And I, I, I'm, I'm not eager for a presentation, to be quite honest. I, when I look back at where we're at, we don't have enough money. And I, yeah, I, I ordered a book. It was very clear. Successful transit has high frequency. In fact, mm -hmm. acceptable frequency is 15 minutes on a route. Good is better. We're not there. Right. We don't have enough money. No. We've expanded our service. It's like we got to figure out something different. And I feel at a loss to for us to do our role because all we're hearing is reports from you guys and I mean you probably don't look forward to this meeting <laughs> so I just think we need to find a I think there's a change needed maybe it's a revisit to the master plan we obviously things don't happen in a month things don't happen in a year around here but I think we need to figure out a process by which we get more engaged and and just and with each other in terms of what do we want to solve because it, it seems like we're missing some stuff and and i'm not at a point where i can recommend anything because i don't know anything other than what it's a 10 million dollar budget that's all we know when we got 30 foot buses and they're all hybrids but that we, I, we just don't know anything to help you out and we want to help you out that's our, that's why we signed up mm -hmm. John, did you have a question? I do. Sorry, I think my uh, John is in a queue. I have myself queued. I mean, my internet is slow. So, um, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, put the presentation together today with the budget. It was actually really helpful and informative. Um, I do agree with Bill that maybe like it's it's kind of depressing to get this information that when you find out that you're like at a, you know. You know, you need to come up with a million dollars. I mean, it's a lot of money. Um, and it, what we have is it, it's currently not working. It's better than what we had in 2016, clearly, right? But it's not where we ultimately want to be. So, you know, you know, my perspective is is that this committee is here to help create solutions. Um, and you know, however we can do that. Diving back into the transit master plan, you know, it's 
you know, I'm five years old now, um, and maybe it's time to to relook at it, right? Um, to give it a, another look to see where we're at and where we're going in you know the next decade, because um, I'm sure that you would like to see a more robust system with more frequent service um, that is uh, reliable and uh, well funded. Um, so it's a, figuring out how to get there. I think is um, where we need to be thinking. You know, in the future, um, you put a lot of time into this. Um, the staff does, and we respect that. Um, and you know, this is volunteer time for everybody on the committee. So we all want it to be time well spent. Um, you know, and Bill and I are, you know, we look at it through the lens of the multimodal commission, you know, and you know, this, I, I, the way I understand it is that our purpose here is to advise multimodal, right? So we then present things up to them and then it goes on to council. So we can do that to help facilitate that process. And the more we understand it and the more we know about the process, um, the better. And I feel like in the last couple of meetings, you've helped, you've helped us do that. So like, I feel like I have a better understanding today than I did, you know, just a few months ago. So I really appreciate you taking the time to do the presentations and explain both you and Haley. Um, it's, I, I really appreciate it. So I just want to say that. Thank you, John. Yeah. Thanks, John. I'll just really quickly say like, and we also hear you that you don't want to just sit here either. Like we want to bring you things that you can provide feedback on. It's just sometimes difficult finding which things those are, but we hear you. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think for us, you know, there's only so many levers that can be pulled, if you will. And and, I, you know, I always hate to blame things on lack of funding, but that is our core issue. We don't have money for buses. We don't have money for service. We don't have money for facilities. And so um, it's not been too long, I think, since the Multimodal Commission had a conversation about funding for transportation. Um, our biggest opportunity and most critical need, in my opinion, is to get the county and the city to do a transit master plan um, and look at what would a transit system look like uh, between the two of us and all for the goal of getting a ballot measure in 2024 for the quarter cent sales tax and you know none of us like taxes but we do have the legislative ability to put a ballot measure on the ballot but at county-wide vote to pass a quarter cent sales tax and a quarter cent sales tax would double our budget and that wouldn't necessarily solve all of our problems, but it would allow us to make investments in facilities that would then allow us to expand our system, give us a more sustainable and um, solid source of funding to count on and depend on. And so, you know, for me, that's the critical path is getting that ballot measure, getting a, getting a joint study done or some way that we can convince county voters to vote and city voters to vote for it. And um, that's the big lever for me that we can pull. We could talk about bus sizes, but at the end of the day, the same driver cost at, no matter what size bus you've got. And so expansion and maintenance of our system requires a better funding source than what we've got now. Thank you, Jess. Can TDA funds be used for to fund transit? Not as it's currently written in the legislature. Okay. Uh, that is that is being revisited though this legislative session but 
they're still, that still has not happened. So no. Um, thank you, Jessica. And thank you, John. Uh, moving on with uh, what I had to say as far as uh, transit committee member updates and rider experience. Uh, we at ARTC have been uh, in touch with uh, city staff as far as uh, getting uh, city county busing. And we just met the other week. Uh, with Jasmine Beach Ferrara and I'm quite sure Vicky has talked to uh, Jessica about that and we've been in touch with the commissioners as far as uh, getting a feasibility study done for the city county bus and we're moving forward on that and that's, that would be a good thing I feel and as far as uh, the transit is concerned I'm extremely proud of every driver that I uh, get on the bus with. They're uh, very professional. They create a good atmosphere in the bus. Uh, when certain uh, people get on the bus and they're not acting the way they're supposed to, and uh, dotting all their I's across and all their T's, drivers have a nice way of telling them uh, how to get back in line. And I appreciate that very much. They do it very eloquently and uh, professionally as well. And um, this past weekend, I was uh, going to a function down in the River Arts District. Uh, and it was uh, the Black Asheville thing about the Black business owners in uh, in that area, in the River Arts District. I was surprised that a bus didn't go all the way down to the River Arts District. I had to walk some 25 minutes from when the bus let me out at uh, Depot Street. And that was the shortest uh, distance for me to travel and being uh, somewhat compromised as far as my breathing. It was, it was a nice trek, but I couldn't believe we didn't have a bus that went down through the River Arts District and um, as far as the businesses were down there, I was surprised at the number of businesses that were down there. And I actually walked over to the big circle sign for the River Arts District. Uh, that was another five, five to seven minutes. So I spent just about a half hour just walking. But uh, I don't know why a bus doesn't go down there. I had drivers didn't give me an answer about it either. But like I said, it was it was quite a walk, but uh, like I said, I I love my transit and I continue to support my transit. And I have some other things, but as uh, Sandy was talking about uh, taking videos and whatnot, I always take pictures and uh, I get back in touch with staff that same day whenever there's something that. I think they need to address that's exactly what I do and as part of being transit and keeping them in touch with what's going on in transit because they can't see everything each and every day and they get the film out and then they can look at it and I appreciate them for taking the time to do that out of that busy schedule. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have anything else? Thank you for your comment, uh, Harvey. Appreciate it. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, moving along, departmental updates, city staff, uh, monthly transit updates, and operation updates. I don't think we have any updates, Harvey. Okay. Okay, uh, if there's nothing more from uh, staff, does do any of my committee members have anything that they wanted to express before we adjourn? Um, Harvey, we have, uh, I think myself and two other people that are waiting to speak. Okay. There it is at the bottom. I didn't look. Okay, Clinton, Bill. Okay, go ahead, Clinton. Colin. 
Clinton, Clinton, because I got a cousin named Clinton. Go ahead, Um, yeah. So this is going back to this conversation that John and Bill were and and Jessica were just having about budget and what we can and can't do and and everything. And and Jessica mentioned a twenty-five cent. Well, not twenty-five cent. A point two five sales tax, which I've I've seen that done in other places like Charleston, which has been very successful in providing good steady funding. Um, question regarding funding is with the new transportation bill that just came out of Congress a few months ago. Are there any bright spots that we can see on that uh, that may help transit? Yeah, yes, there are. I should I should mention that. Um, so the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act did approve some funding increases for transit over the next um, five years, definitely, hopefully 10 years. And those are, I would say, very helpful, but not nearly enough. Um, so it's really just the, the federal portion of the formula funds that would receive an increase of about 20 to 30%. We're still sort of waiting on the numbers, but, um, you know, the federal revenue that we receive is maybe uh, between 15 and 20 percent of what we of what of what our revenue is and so a 20 to 30 percent increase of that one funding source will help but it's not um, enough to help us in a substantial way i would say it's not enough to buy a new bus or pay for another route um, it might be enough to help us with some uh, technological improvement, uh, maybe allow us to have another staff person someday in our transit and our city transit division. Um, but it's not, not as much as I wanted, <laughs> but it is good. Upward, upwards is good. Bill, Loftus. Thanks. So, Jessica, I, I don't want to lose track of what you said earlier. It really uh, was interesting to me, and I want to make sure I got it. And it might require another meeting, but you said the, the big hole, your view is we just don't have enough money. And you were thinking that if we could put together a regional study and then let that be the input to a proposed sales tax that that might be a way in which we could get more money. It's, is that what you were suggesting? And the, the follow up yeah. question is how does this committee make that happen? Um, well, I think that so there's a few things going on and Harvey kind of referenced some of it. There's a, a group called Art C, the Art Art Coalition, and it's got some uh, representatives of county interests as well. And there's been ongoing discussions of that group with with the county about, you know, the need to, to do a study that looks looks beyond just the city of Asheville service, but also looks at the paratransit service, the trailblazer that county runs, um, but also, you know, other opportunities like, like, um, like van pool or carpool, car sharing types of services that could help meet some needs. Um, so the car artsy coalition is doing some advocacy with the county and with the city um, Better Buses Together is also doing advocacy. And I think we're reaching a critical mass right now on that conversation where I do think that 
in the in the semi near future, there will be um, hopefully a budget request from both the city and the county to help fund a study. And um, and I think I think for me the study I think that the the transit master plan that we have is good. Um, keep in mind we've only implemented the first year. Well, we haven't even implemented the whole first year. And all the other recommendations in there are very valid and are probably the next big things that we should be doing. But is that enough to get voters that live in the county to vote yes for a quarter cent sales tax? I don't know. What we need is like, I'll call it a package that gets us to a yes vote. And I think that the county needs to be involved in that. And so the mechanism to get there, I believe, is to have some kind of joint planning effort that says, here's what your money would buy you. Um, okay. So is that something that multimodal should recommend to council? That could definitely be, yeah. And um, I'm planning on putting a memo together soon, if I can, that would kind of try to put everything I just said verbally into like an actual document that I can provide to the city manager with my recommendations. Um, and so that could be something that I bring forward to this group and to multimodal for their input and forwarding on to the council and okay, to the looking. county. Excellent. So if we look forward to 2024, when we want this voted on, when does multimodal need to make a decision so John and I can go to multimodal with get on their agenda and start pushing it? Um, probably, probably within the next couple months. So are you okay with us asking Dennis to include this as an agenda item on a multimodal meeting in the next couple of months? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I have, I still have a comment, actually, Harvey, if I may. Uh, sure, recognize Sandy. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to thank Jessica um, wholeheartedly for all the her hard work that she does because um, I was actually thinking about how does the county fit into all this earlier before she mentioned how it does. And um, I think we've made uh, progress as far as everyone understanding what needs to be done um, for all of us in Asheville city limits and also Buncombe County. And uh, as I was in transit earlier, uh, when you were talking about Haley doing the grant and I have friends that uh, write out grants and I know it's a very arduous process. And I wanna thank you very much, um, Haley, for doing that for everybody. Thank you, Sandy. We appreciate it. Thank you, Sandy. Okay, Brandon, I keep seeing you popping up. Did you have anything to say? No, sir. The kids are running around behind me and I'm trying to keep them out of the screen. But yes, thank you, Haley. Uh, grant writing, that's, I was I was telling my kids about it, actually pointing you out. That's, that's awesome. Thank you very much for doing that. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks everyone thank for your you, time. <laughs> uh, I would like to uh, thank everyone for that input on this day it was a very productive meeting and very learned as well and if nobody has anything left to say i hereby adjourn this meeting oh thank Have you too Justin. <laughs>